one, two, wine spirits, sommelier scavenger hunt, which I actually like to call Celebrity Smackdown. We're gonna have four teams today who visited four different regions. Those teams sought out what they felt were the top six wines that best represented that region's terroir. You guys today, as tasters, as voters, will determine which team found the best wines. It's coming up first. Oh my god, it's the Canada team. Team Ontario, led by Michael Mandrigal. Magic Mike, hold on to your titles, everybody. <laughs> Magic Mike with his team, Michelle Vichalia and Josiah Bellavino are gonna give us the full Monty yes. on Ontario. Bye. We were really knocked out by the wines of Ontario because there we found a region that had very, very old limestone, almost twice the age of Burgundy. We found cool climate, and we found the moderating effect of Lake Ontario. And as we were tasting these wines, we were saying to ourselves, wow, these are fantastic. Why don't more people know about the wines of Ontario? So we created kind of an evidence chart here after watching a few episodes of Homeland, and we wanted to connect the story of where it started and where it ended up. So the first one in front of you, you have, is the Norman Hardy 2013 County Pinot Noir. This wine comes from Prince Edward County. So this is the coldest and furthest east area of Ontario. This is really a, a, an entry into Ontario. Low alcohol, lots of saltiness, phenolic ripeness, and high acidity. So we have these benches, which are basically the slopes that come up from the lake. We have Lake Ontario, which is basically the temperature control system of Ontario. So what happens is, as that warm air comes up, it basically keeps everything nice and warm during the winter and keeps everything cool during the summer. Team number two, please welcome Bolanet Valley participants, Master Sommelier John Zavo, Veronique Rivet, and hat model Brad Royale. We didn't bring any bling, we didn't bring any flash, we just brought you maps and dirt. We've got some beautiful weathered volcanic joy soil on the table. Don't be afraid to dive in there and dig in. We call it soil crudo, really tasty stuff. <laughs> Second important geological event happened about 17 million years ago when uh, this part of North America drifted over a volcanic hotspot and up through the crust came an amazing amount of lava, basaltic lava that flowed all the way from Idaho and Montana down the Columbia Gorge into the northern Willamette Valley and then weathered into that beautiful stuff you see there. So that's mainly in the Dundee Hills and also the Eola Amity Hills, right? Those are mainly volcanic areas. Team number three, West Sonoma Coast with David Sawyer, Kathy Pete, and Matt Sommelier, Ryan Sidney, Champagne Drinking, Jack Mason. Well, welcome guys, thank you so much for having us. And uh, today, what we're really gonna let you guys do is uh, just experience West Sonoma like we did. So, the first thing is, you guys all have ruffles in front of you, right? Yes. What are ruffles all about? Ridges. They're all about ridges, right? And so that's gonna be our conversation for today. What we found throughout all of these wines is kind of more of a savory, more, uh, you know, non-fruit character to a lot of these wines. Frankincense, pipe tobacco, sweet spice, orange oil, lots of kind of fun non-fruits. Uh, this is right at the boundary of that marine layer uh, that he was talking about. So um, proximity to the ocean is giving it that cool climate that slows the ripening of the wine, but the elevation is allowing it still a good bit of sunshine so that it does get phenolically ripe. Phelps quarter moon back down to freestone occidental arm. Um, this gets a little bit of influence through the Petaluma Gap, so we're getting spray, you know, here comes that marine layer. Jesus. And uh, they, they have uh, obviously a bigger ripo. It's, it's just the bigger, broader shouldered big brother to the other siblings that come from this region. Again, run through with a bullet of savory. Team San Cruz, Aaron Scala, Booth Hardy, and the Rebel and Rebel, Kim Prokoshin. 
Hello, New York. We are so excited to share these wines from the Santa Cruz Mountain AVA with you. This is a unique AVA based on altitude. And on the west side, you'll, the vines have to be over 400 feet. On the east side, they have to be over 800 feet. And what this does is it lifts those vineyards up into the sky, up onto the mountaintops, out of the fog, sometimes in the fog, but mostly out of the fog. And when you're standing in the vineyards there and the fog is coming off the ocean, you can see these little mountaintops. They look like islands covered with vineyards, and it looks like vineyard islands in the sky. So redwood trees are interesting because they absorb, absorb moisture from the air. Um, that's why you find them in foggy areas. So the whole area smells sort of like a damp, woodsy, uh, mushroomy uh, forest. It's beautiful. You get the ocean influence, the maritime influence. You get the redwood forest and local chaparral. And you get the influences of altitude. <laughs> get up here, Boo. Okay, ready? And what you end up with is an artful bottle of Santa Cruz Mountain Pinot Noir. <laughs> <Okay, enjoy. laughs> Oh, Canada people. Oh, fucking Canada. Cheers. The Norman Hardy Pinot Noir was one of my favorite of the tasting, just in terms of excitement, in terms of where it's going, the salinity, the lightness, the just the way the balance it all held together. You could see more maturity in certain regions and others, and probably more, I wouldn't say quality, but more precision because winemakers had more vintage understand their place and their soul over years. And I really felt it in the Oregon flight, in the Santa Cruz flight. Mm -hmm. Sonoma was very, very good with the, the fact that they were working with very talented winemakers that probably understood faster the potential of the region. It's, it's important, especially for a grape like Pinot Noir that is so, so sensitive to weather and place to have that kind of experience with the area. I had never seen it um, until going to Prince Edward County where they actually bury the vines over the winter. They literally pile up the, the soil from the ground to protect the, the roots for the winter so they don't freeze, creating like an igloo-like effect. I've never seen that before. What they have there is more soulful and honest because of Niagara Falls, because of the limestone, because of the climate than a lot of places growing New World Pinot. I think at the end of the day, it's just like a sleeper wine region. Like mm -hmm. nobody really knows yet, but like they are definitely gonna get on the map soon. Yeah. They're, you know, they're on the fast track. Give it another 10 years. And then I think you're gonna talk about Ontario wine everywhere. The most exciting was the expression of Ontario and Canada because we already served those wines and I got the pleasure of tasting them last year at another event and it's, it's exciting and, and, and brisk, and they certainly speak of place right now. You have an idea of what California Pinot Noir is. It's rich, bombastic, cherry cola, like sweet fruit. Uh, and when we got out there, it was really interesting to um, hang out with a lot of these people because you know it's not easy to make or grow wine uh, there. And so uh, you really have to kind of care about it. It's, uh, most of the people that we saw are, are small, and they make very, very small production out of all these single vineyards. And the wines are much more savory and, and have a lot of really interesting, you know, orange oil, frankincense, piped about kind of sweet spice to them. Um, so I was actually very blown away by uh, West Sonoma. Topographically, how rugged it was, all the things that go, you don't really, you can't really imagine that unless you're there. Yes, the weather extremes were a definite surprise. I mean, knew that it was going to be cool, but it was very cold and rainy yeah. and windy. So uh, It's hardcore. I mean, they're, those guys, they're working hard out there. As, as, as Jack said, I mean, you're getting less than two tons per acre. Yeah. And, you know, they're they're not making these wines for their egos or no. ours. They're making it because 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 they love, mm -hmm. you know, what's coming out of, of, of the vines. They're definitely wines for people who like like subtlety. You know, they're not about punching in the face. Like they're about digging in a little bit and figuring out what's going on there. So when Carol dropped us off, and we were then on our own. Yeah, that was probably the most we were like, are we going in the right direction? Do we oh, think yeah. we're going in the right direction? So. We were heading up to Hirsch. And <laughs> yeah, there's like, there's no <laughs> cell phone service. There's yeah, like no Wi Fi. You are like in the middle of nowhere. It yeah. is. And dirt yeah. roads. Yeah, yeah. 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 Your little Google map ain't working, that's for sure. But yeah. our last day, the fog lifted mm -hmm. and it was really beautiful. We yeah. kind of yeah. woke up extra early that day and tried to sneak out and see some vineyards that we had sort of missed in the fog. Things. It's altitude with the marine effect. So it's, 
altitude and fog play that uh, central thing together. The altitude also, uh, when you get up there, there's cooler temperatures, so it immediately takes your, um, the Pinot Noir especially, it makes it like a cool climate Pinot Noir. As you go further up in altitude, you get more of that darker fruit characteristics and kind of like this meaty, um, almost like a meaty Pinot Noir, and they, the skin gets thicker and you have kind of like a bigger, like more uh, structured sort of Pinot. But Booth pointed out as um, as we were putting together our wines that just about every wine we picked was on sandy soil. The whole mountains aren't sandy, right. but we tended to gravitate towards those. So yeah, a little bit, I guess a little more freshness to the wines um, that we that we really loved. Off of the ocean, you definitely get like a <coughs> salty fog that comes in, and you can breathe it and taste it. It really feels like you're tasting like ocean mist, mm -hmm. right. and that settles on the grapes. And I really think that you. <clears throat> a couple of things. It makes it a really moist region to grow, especially if you're underneath that fog light line. But you also get that salty character in the wine, which I think stood. That was one thing that carried through through all the wines for me. Um, yeah, the trees are not like East Coast trees. I mean, it's like you're walking in Manhattan. That's one that was surprisingly my favorite, besides the uh, Canadian wine, was the uh, Ghost Rider, which was leaner in style than I anticipated and uh, elegant without uh, too much heat on it. It's always good to be reminded that you don't know everything. Froze, Three yeah. Canadians <laughs> that froze to death in Oregon. I think that's pretty funny. Um, yeah, when we, and, and, and we didn't burn down the house, thank God, but we were burning everything we could get our hands on to get some heat. My first visit ever to Oregon and to the Willamette. Um, so definitely was very excited at the idea of going. And it was very, I mean, a reproach and, and doing this very soil focused tastings. Uh, was a great way to uncover the region and uh, debunk quite a bit of myths I had about uh, Oregon and, and the Willamette in particular. Willamette. Willamette. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're always, right, sommeliers are always, in, and, and people in the wine industry are always talking about terroir, and it's, it's, it's a concept that's always thrown out there and that we love, but, you know, that... that, that, that is also debatable on many aspects. So th this was really, really cool in that sense that this was a clear demonstration of, 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 of the supremacy in a way of, of terroir. To the point where after a few days when we were doing it, we were always tasting blind and yeah, okay, where's this from? Oh, this is definitely sedimentary or this is definitely volcanic. So that was really, really cool. Sexy Sauvignon Blanc is a bit of an oxymoron. <laughs> um, sexy Cabernet Sauvignon, probably the same way. Yeah, put your pants back on. <laughs> and and uh, today we had a chance to see uh, Pinots that were uh, very elegant, very graceful, very fine-grained, and also some that were on the, uh, the richer, more opulent side. Um, less of those, but I think that's a function of uh, the fact that the selections were in back sommeliers, who in general tend towards a more elegant uh, expression of any variety. Uh, so we mostly saw pretty uh, fine-grained, delicate, precise pinots, uh, which I adore, and uh, it's a wonderful way to spend a cold winter morning with clean, fresh wines. Yeah, it, was a, it was a good day for North America, I think. And that's where we came up with the name Team Extreme, because she, she was like, you guys are extreme, you're awesome. So we're Team Extreme, West Sonoma Coast. That was cool. <laughs>